We had uh, six questions for homework last night, one to seven on page 817, except for number two. Uh, we need to go over four, five, six, and seven. Let's take a look at those now. <laughs> Analysis of rock sample shows that only one sixteenth of the original amount of chlorine 36 remains in the rock. Estimate the age of the rock given that the half life of chlorine is 3.0 times 10 to the 5 years. We're going to find in number four the age of the rock, given that the half-life of chlorine is 3.0 times 10 to the 5 years. That's going to be T one half. Uh, we only have 1 16th of the original amount remaining. What's that going to be? Four. N. It, yeah, it's, it's big N. It's the amount that remains. It's the amount that remains, right, Brad? After, after this amount of time. Uh, what are we going to start off with? N0 is going to be equal to what? One, right? What's the age of the rock? We want to find, we want to find a uh, little t here. Now we want to find a little t. There's only one equation that we even have with a little t in it, and that's n is equal to t over t one half. The one that's not on your data sheet, but the one that's pretty easy to remember. Rearrange that. A uh, little t is equal to n times t one half, uh, but we don't know what little n is. So we've got a couple of options here. We can go and use the other equation and use logarithms with the other equation to find a little n. Or we can use a divide by 2 method, which lots of you probably like better than the, than the logarithm method. The divide by 2 method means we start a little table here. Little n, big N. After zero half-lives, we've got one remaining. After one half-life, we've got one half. After two half-lives, we've got one quarter. After three half-lives, we've got one eighth. After four half-lives, we've got one sixteenth. Could we do this as a decimal number? Sure we could. Why am I doing it as a fraction here? Because the question is given to us in a fraction form, right? Uh, if we wanted to convert that to a decimal and then make these all decimal numbers, then that would be fine as well. Somebody this morning during scheduled help asked me, well, I don't know when to stop. There we go. Five, little n is equal to five, that's one thirty-second. Six, it's one sixty-fourth. When do we know when to stop? When it, gets, when it gets to what n is, the final amount is, okay? We want the final amount to be 1 16th. That means little n at, when big N is 1 16th, little n is going to be equal to 4. So let's multiply 4 times the half-life, 3 times 10 to the 5 years. That's going to give me 1.2 times 10 to the 6 years. Is that okay? All right, let's take a look at number 5 then. Five says a radioactive tracer used in a medical test has a half-life of 2.6 hours. What proportion of this tracer will remain after 24 hours? They inject this stuff into your body. They put this radioactive material into your body to trace your blood flow. Uh, there's benefits to that. There's risks to that as well. Having said that, the amount of radioactive material that they put in there is small. The risk is small, but it's not zero. What proportion remains after 24 hours? This is going to be T. Uh, right away, we could find N if we wanted to. T over T one half. That's going to be 24 hours divided by 2.6 hours. So that give me 9.2307, 9.2307 half lives. That's a lot of half lives. Okay, that's a lot of half lives after one day. How much remains after that amount of time, after nine half-lives? Well, let's say n is equal to n sub 0, 1 half to the little n. What are you going to make n 0? You can make it 1, or you can make it 100. It depends on whether you want your answer in decimal form or in percent form. Personally, I like the percent thing, so I'm going to make it 100. Okay, we calculate that, whatever works out to be is, is my answer there in percent. Now, Emil, if you make that one, you're going to get the correct answer, but it's kind of like saying, you know, uh, you are, you're, how old are you, 16? Okay, 16, you're 50% of my age, or you're 0.5 of my age, right? They're both the correct answer, but they're two different numbers based on whether you're having a decimal equivalent or a percent, right? If you make it one, then you're going to get a decimal number. If you make it 100, you're going to get a percent 
of the original amount. Yep. Oh, well, it would be clear. It would be clear what they wanted. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether they'd ask for a decimal or, or a percent, but you'd know what they were looking for there, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think that's right. If you use 100, you get 0.166. I think the answer in the book is 0.00166. Yeah, so 0 0.00166. This is the decimal number, right? This is the, Emil is 0.5 of my age, right? Um, this is the, Emil is 50% of my age. Make sense? You know, the decimal of the original amount or the percent of the original amount. So either one is okay. Just be careful on a test, obviously. It'll specify and make sure you do the right one on a test. Six, an archaeologist finds... A wooden arrow shaft with a proportion of carbon-14 that's about 25% of that in a living tree. Estimate the age of the arrow. Um, all living things have a relatively constant amount of radioactive carbon-14 in them, including you, including me. Okay, we consume radioactive carbon-14 all the time. Every time we breathe, we consume radioactive carbon-14. And that's okay. It's normal. Okay, we've adapted to that over millions of years. It's safe. They okay, are our body repairs itself much, much quicker than the damage that is actually done by the decay of that radioactive carbon-14 in our bodies. That value remains roughly constant because although we keep consuming it, we also keep, it also keeps decaying. So again, it remains a relatively constant value, whether you're talking about in a plant or an animal. We know roughly how much radioactive carbon-14 is supposed to be present in a living thing. Now, if we find something that's dead, like a tree branch, or like a, you know, a mummy, a mummified body from thousands of years ago, or some kind of native tool that was made out of wood, okay, we can measure the amount of carbon-14 that's still present in there, compare it to the amount that should have been present while that device was once a living thing, a tree or a person or whatever, and then find out not how old the thing is, per se, but rather how long it's been since that thing died, since the person died or since the tree was cut down to produce this wooden arrow or bow or, or whatever. Let's do this question here now. 25% um, of that in an original, in a living tree branch. Uh, let's say, for number six, let's say n sub zero is 100%, because that's what we started with. n is going to be equal to 25%. Um, the half-life of carbon-14, we have to know this. Okay, we have to know this to answer this question. It's 5,730 years. You don't need to memorize it. That was in our example problem that we did yesterday. Okay, if you didn't remember that, then that's okay. It would be given to you on a test if you needed that number. We want to find T. Say N is equal to T over T one-half. We don't know what little n is. Let's use our little divide by two method or logarithms, either one. After zero half lives, 100%, one half life, 50%, two half lives, we're down to 25%. Okay, n is equal to two. The half life is 5,730 years. That gives us uh, t of 11,460 years. How old is the arrow? Well, we don't really know. When was the tree cut down that made the arrow? About 11,460 years ago. Could that be off by a little bit? Sure it could, right? First of all, the amount of radioactive carbon-14 that was in that tree isn't exact. Okay, it's, it's approximate. Second of all, it's all based on statistics, right? Okay, we know that on average, half of it will decay in 5,700 years, but it's not necessarily exactly that. Okay, plus or minus a few years, that's when the tree was cut down. Or at least when that branch that made that, uh, that, made that arrow was broken off the tree. Finally, question number seven says a radioactive sample has an activity of 2.5 megabacquerel in a half-life of 12 hours. What will be the activity of the sample a week later. A Baccarel, if you remember from yesterday, a Baccarel is a unit of radioactive decay. It's one decay 
per second. It indicates an amount, an amount of decay. In other words, it's either going to be n or n0. Since this is my original amount, we're going to call it n0. The activity at the end of this is going to be n. This is my half-life. And this is my time. Let's say little n is equal to t over t one half. What's a week in hours? Is 168 divided by t one half is 12 hours, and I think that worked out to be 14. 14 half lives. And we say n is equal to n sub zero one half to the little n. We're going to say it's uh, 2.5 mega baccarel. What do we get there? Zero point. Okay, so zero point zero 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 one five, or one point five times ten to the minus four. Uh, and the units for that would be mega baccarel. I think in your textbook, I think they say it's one point five or something like that. One point five times ten to the two, uh, because they're giving it to you in baccarel, not in mega baccarel. Right? It doesn't matter. Good. Uh, somebody this morning during scheduled help was asking about these units and you know and how we how we keep them straight. Uh, if you don't recognize the unit, it's n or n zero. Because the only other units that we have in these questions are for time, either half life or for time, right? And you're going to recognize those units. It might be seconds, it might be milliseconds, it might be hours or days or years, but you're going to recognize it if it's if it's a unit that represents time. Okay, if it indicates n or n0, you'll probably recognize it, but you may not. If you see a unit that you don't recognize, it's either big N or big N0. Okay? Are we good at those four questions that you guys had trouble with? All right, good. Well, this looks fun today, doesn't it? The week before Christmas, we introduced the concept of radioactivity, and then we went a little bit further to transmutation. Transmutation, we said, is the conversion of one element to the other, and there's a number of ways that that can happen. Transmutation can happen via radioactivity. Radioactivity can convert one element to the other. Today, we're going to learn about two more ways that transmutation can occur. In other words, two more ways that we can convert one element to something else. Those two ways that we're going to learn about today are called nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. How many people take biology? Who do you have for biology? Better? Herzog? Okay. Um, you guys talked about mitosis. Uh, the last time I took biology myself was in grade 10. It was the equivalent of bio 20, I suppose. Uh, but that was a long time ago, 1988. I remember very little from biology when I was in grade 10. But one thing that I do remember is mitosis. For whatever reason, I remember mitosis. Cellular division. Um, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. But I remember my teacher also describing it not only, or calling it not only cellular mitosis, but she also called it cellular fission. Has your biology teacher ever called it cellular fission? No. Fission means the splitting up, dividing. Mitosis is the dividing of a cell. Cellular fission would be the dividing of a cell. Nuclear fission would be the dividing of a nucleus. It's one heavy nucleus splitting up into lighter nuclei. Now, the example that you see up on the board here, the equation that you see up on the board here is an example of a reaction that is nuclear fission. There's a whole lot of things happening here. Neutron, uranium-235, krypton, barium, more neutrons, energy. Here's what we've got to look at. The big element on the left side and the big elements on the right-hand side. Let's pretend for just a moment that the neutrons and the energy don't exist. When we look only at the radioactive nuclei, uranium-235, 
krypton and barium, you can see clearly that one thing that's heavier is splitting up into two things that are lighter. Therefore, it is a fission reaction. There are a million other examples, not literally a million, but lots of other examples of fission reactions that you may see sometime. If you see one that you've never seen before in a test, that's okay. You can recognize it because it's always in the form of one heavy thing is splitting up into two or more lighter things. There will be a neutron on the left side. There will be two or three or four neutrons on the right side. There will be energy on the right side. But this is what you want to focus on to determine whether or not it's a fission reaction. One heavy thing splits up into two or more lighter things. Take a look at this over here. 200 mega electron volts of energy is generated in this particular nuclear reaction. Is that a lot of energy? Sounds like it. But the reality is it's about enough energy to move a speck of dust. So it's not really a great deal of energy per se. What we need if we want to move lots of specks of dust is a lot of these reactions taking place. Well, how do they take place in the first place? You got uranium-235, which will, on its own, decay, but it may take thousands of years in order to decay. We don't want to wait that long. So we kind of kick-start it along. We kind of prompt it to go. It's kind of like an easy analogy of, a, of an iceberg in the North Atlantic off the coast of Newfoundland. You hear it cracking in the cold. Like you, you sense that it wants to break apart, but it's not breaking apart. So what do you do? You crash a big ship into it. What happens? Well, then all of a sudden the iceberg breaks into a couple pieces. Okay, this neutron is our Titanic. This is our big iceberg. We crash the Titanic into our big iceberg, and all of a sudden that big iceberg now becomes unstable and splits apart. Does that make sense? So we kind of kick-start it into motion. A neutron hits the uranium-235, or whatever other fissionable nucleus that it is, splits it apart into maybe krypton and barium, maybe something else, and then either two, three, four neutrons on the right-hand side, and some energy as well on the right-hand side. That's the basic reaction, but that's only enough energy generated to move a speck of dust. Where do we get the rest of the energy from to blow up a city or to power a city in the case of a nuclear power plant? We've got to get lots of these reactions taking place. That's where this whole chain reaction thing comes into play. A chain reaction occurs when the products of one reaction cause more reactions. What do we mean by that? Well, if it takes a neutron colliding with uranium-235 to generate this energy to move a speck of dust, and we get three neutrons produced as the products of that first reaction, then maybe, just maybe, those three neutrons can cause three more reactions. Maybe those three neutrons can hit three more uranium-235s and produce three of these reactions. Well, then we're going to get nine neutrons out, which cause nine more reactions. And then we're going to get 27 neutrons out, which cause 27 reactions. You can see how very, very quickly this is grow, going to grow to an exponential, to a gigantic number of reactions that are taking place. And all of a sudden, you're not moving a speck of dust. You're moving a gigantic number of specks of dust. Okay, you're generating enough energy to convert to electricity to power a city. Or you're generating enough energy to blow up a city in the case of a nuclear bomb. Make sense? A nuclear chain reaction, when the products of one reaction will cause more reactions to take place. Um, 235, no, you're right. 92 and 141 add up to give me, what is that, one, two, 233? Yeah, you're right. And then 36 plus 56 do add up to give me 92. So 233 and 92, we're missing something, right? We're missing, well, we had 235 protons and neutrons here. We had 233 protons and neutrons here. We need, uh, no, we need three because we actually had 236 on the left side, right? One neutron, 235 gives me 236. 233 plus three neutrons gives me 236. 
So it still balances. It's a little bit confusing when we see that coefficient in front of it, right? We still have to count those neutrons, though. Mass defect, here's a term that you've probably never heard before. Mass defect is, we'll define it a little bit better in just a few minutes, but for now, let's just go with this. It's the missing mass. The parent nuclei, which are always what we start with on the left-hand side, it's, in chemistry terms, it's the reactants. The daughter nuclei, which on the right-hand side, in chemistry terms, are, they're going to be the products. The daughter nuclei are lighter than the parent nuclei. In chemistry, you learn the law of conservation of mass. I remember this when I taught Science 9. The law of conservation of mass. Mass can't be created. It can't be destroyed. That's a lie. It can be. It, well, it can't really be destroyed per se, but it can disappear. It can be changed into energy. And that's what happens here. We, we're missing mass. Mass disappears. If this weighs whatever, 10 to the, whatever times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, then this weighs a little bit less times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The difference is made up right here. That missing mass, that mass defect, was changed into energy. And that's where we get that 200 mega electron volts, that energy that moves that speck of dust. Now, the other kind of reaction that we're going to talk about today is called the nuclear fusion reaction. This occurs when we fuse two light nuclei together. Remember, fission, one heavy splits apart into two light. Fusion is two light nuclei fuse to make one heavier nucleus. There's lots of examples of fusion as well. This is one of them. Hydrogen 2, heavy hydrogen. Okay, it's a heavy isotope of hydrogen. Normal hydrogen has one protons, no neutrons, H1. Okay, H2 has an extra neutron. Chemically, it's identical to H1, but it's twice as heavy. These two things fuse together, they produce helium-3 and an extra neutron and some energy. That's it, right? Well, that energy is enough to move maybe a speck of dust. So how do we keep this reaction going? It's not the neutrons that keep it going, because they don't contribute to this reaction at all. Rather, it's the energy. In order to make these two things fuse together, we need to actually pump some energy into the system to kickstart it. Here's why. These hydrogen nuclei are both positively charged. There is a force of repulsion that acts between them. They don't want to come together. The closer they get together, the smaller R is, the bigger F is, the bigger that force of repulsion is, right? As they get closer and closer and closer, the harder they push away from each other. In order to get them to actually come close enough to fuse together, they have to be moving really fast. So they have to get a lot of energy from somewhere. Usually that's in the form of heat. The sun undergoes fusion all the time. How does the sun cause hydrogen to fuse together? The sun is hot, really hot. Okay, these hydrogen fuse together. They produce helium, another neutron, and some energy. Now some of this energy could cause more hydrogen to fuse together. So it's still a chain reaction, but it's not the neutrons that are sustaining the chain reaction, rather it's the energy that comes from it that's sustaining the chain reaction. Make sense? Where did that energy come from? Once again, that mass defect, that missing mass. The parent weighs more than the daughter. The difference is called the mass defect. That gets converted to energy. Make sense? Good. Well, let's talk about mass defect in a, in a tiny bit more detail here, okay? We're actually going to give you two good definitions for mass defect. One, the one we pretty much already gave you, it's the missing mass. It's the difference in mass between the 
parent and the daughter. In other words, it's a difference in mass between the left side and the right side. The right side will always weigh a little bit less than the left side does. Now, the second definition sounds different, but in the end, the second definition really is what causes the first. Don't worry about the details of how that happens, but just trust me. If the first definition sounds odd, though, the second one's going to sound really odd. It's the difference in mass between the nucleus of an atom and the nucleons. What's a nucleon? A nucleon is a proton or a neutron. Let's say there's 10 of us in this room right now. We each have a mass of 50 kilograms for simplicity's sake. Okay, what's the total mass? We're a, we're a nucleus. Okay, we're a nucleus. Each of us are nucleons, things that make up a nucleus. We each have a mass of 50 kilograms. What's the mass of the nucleus? 10 times 50 is 500. Okay. So if we take the mass of each nucleon, 50, 50, 50, 50 times 10, the total mass of the nucleons is 500. The mass of the nucleus would be 499.7-ish kilograms. The mass of the total is less than the mass of the sum of the components. Which is really, really crazy. Really, really wacky. The difference, again, is energy. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail on how exactly that happens, but it does. Okay, the mass of the nucleus is different than the mass of what makes up the nucleus. And that's, in the end, what causes this difference between the mass of the products and the reactants, the whole rearrangement of protons and neutrons in there. The binding energy, you can define that in a number of ways, but we're only going to define it in one way, the way that's important for us. The energy that is released in a nuclear reaction. the energy that's released in the nuclear reaction. And that energy that's released in the nuclear reaction can be found in a pretty simple way, actually, by Einstein's energy mass equivalence equation. If we know the mass defect, m, and we know c, the speed of light, and we multiply m by the speed of light squared, we will get the equivalent energy of that mass defect. And that corresponds to the energy that is released in the reaction. One way we define the binding energy. Make sense? More or less, at least. A couple units that I just want to familiarize you with here. The first unit we use from time to time. The last two we will probably never use. But I want to just point them out just in case. This, this unit here, this U unit, you may recognize from chemistry, some of you. It's what we call an atomic mass unit. We define it as the mass of 1 12th of a carbon-12 nucleus. One atomic mass unit is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. You don't have to memorize that number. It's on your data sheet, on the left-hand side of your data sheet. These two units are also mass. I'm not going to give you a conversion factor for them. I'm pretty sure we're not going to ever have to use them. I just want you to recognize that they measure mass. When we see this, the instinct is that they measure electron volts or energy, right? If you take a look at this. It's electron volts per C squared, giga electron volts per C squared, energy over C squared. Energy over C squared isn't energy. Energy over C squared is, is mass, right? So this is a unit of mass that we may very well have to use, but it's not a very hard one to do the conversion for. These are units for mass that I'm pretty sure 
we're not going to have to use. I think in 18 years here, I don't think I've ever seen them used once in a single problem. Now watch, it'll happen for you guys, of course. So far, so good? Let's do a really fun example right now. And you know what I mean, you know what I mean by a really fun example, right? I mean one that's kind of hard, yeah. yeah. By the way, um, this table on page 881, it's in your notes, although the numbers are so small that you're not going to be able to see it in your notes. Refer to the table on page 881. We're going to have ourselves a little quiz on this tomorrow. I'll only ask you 10 of the numbers, though. Okay. Um, no, no, you have to memorize them all. And then I'll quiz you on 10 of them tomorrow. You know I'm not going to do that. Right? <laughs> these are... These are... These are the atomic masses of, of various isotopes, various, uh, various isotopes that we may see in questions. It's just a reference page, right? We just have to be able to find the mass of different isotopes somewhere. We're going to use this table in order to do it. Page 881, okay? Oh, yeah. If you need it, they'll give it to you, yeah. In all likelihood, to be honest, if you need it, they'll give it to you in kilograms as opposed to atomic mass units, which makes it a little bit easier. The problem we're going to do is based on atomic mass units, kind of a worst case scenario. If they give it to us in kilograms, great, take it, run with it. If they give, give it to us atomic mass units, it's a little bit harder, a little bit harder to do, but you just have to do a little bit of a conversion in there, which we'll do in the example that I'll show you in just a second here. Here's the problem that I want to do, 16.14 on page 819. There's a couple on your page. This is the second one that you're going to see on your in your notes here. It says calculate the energy released in the fission reaction. Uranium-235 plus a neutron goes to barium-141, krypton-92, three neutrons. This is the exact same reaction as I showed you in the example, actually. Your notes. How do you know this is fission besides the fact that they say it's fission? Well, if we pretend there's no neutrons, we've got one heavy thing producing two lighter things, right? Nuclear fission as opposed to two heavy, lighter things producing one heavier thing. Splitting apart. It's like mitosis. Where does the energy in a nuclear reaction, any nuclear reaction, come from? Two, two words. We defined it just a minute ago. Binding energy, yeah, yeah. That's the one I'm looking for, though. Mass defect. And what's mass defect defined as? The missing mass. Let's find the missing mass. There is a mass of the parent. There's a mass of the left side. There's also a mass of the daughter nuclei. The mass of the right side. Let's get the mass of each of them. Let's find out what the difference is. And then let's convert that missing mass into an energy using Einstein's equals mc squared equation. Katie's got the table in front of her. Okay, we could flip back a couple of pages and we could see the numbers for the mass of uranium-235 and for a neutron and for barium-141 and so on. Katie's just going to give us those numbers, okay? You would get them off of that table, though. Katie, what's the mass of uranium-235? Okay, and that's measured in atomic mass units as opposed to grams or kilograms, obviously. The mass of a neutron is one point. Zero, that's in the top right-hand corner of the table, Katie? Uh, 1.008665 atomic mass units. Good. Okay, let's get the mass of the left-hand side now, the mass of the blue box. Let's add these two up. With your calculators now, please, let's calculate this plus this. What do we get? 236 point... 052595. So here's the mass of the left hand side. Now let's get the mass of the right hand side. Would you expect the mass of the left side to be greater or smaller than the mass of the right side? In other words, is blue bigger or smaller than red? Should be bigger. We're going to lose mass in this process, right? The mass, the missing mass, the mass defect results in energy being produced. And that's what we're trying to find. All right, so let's get the mass of barium-141. Katie, what is it? 140.914. Yep. 
Thank you. And the mass of Krypton 92 is 91 point atomic mass units. And the mass of three neutrons is three times 1.008665 atomic mass units. Let's calculate the total mass on the right-hand side now. 235.019. Okay, 235.201907. I expected it to be 235 point something, not because I calculated it in my head, but because I knew it was going to be close to the number that we started with. It's going to be less, but it's going to be close to the number that we started with. All right, let's get now what we call the mass defect. It's going to be 236.052595 minus 235.201907 atomic mass units. That gives me what? 0 0.850, 688, again, atomic mass units. The good news is, the few times that I've actually seen this as a question on an exam, they give you the mass in kilograms already, as opposed to atomic mass units. That makes it a little bit easier because it saves us from the conversion. Okay, if they give you the mass in kilograms, we're, we're pretty much done. All we have to do at that point is multiply the mass defect by the speed of light squared. If they don't give it to me in kilograms, if it's in atomic mass units like it is here, then we've got to convert it to kilograms. On your data sheet, you see that one atomic mass unit is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. 0 0.850688 atomic mass units is equal to X kilograms. What's X? In other words, how many kilograms of this uranium-235 did we lose in this process? In other words, what's the mass defect in kilograms? Uh, let's keep going. Uh, exactly 1.41? No, 1.41, 2, Okay. Times 10 to the minus 27, and that's going to be kilograms. Good. Okay, now let's take that number. We converted it to kilograms again. Uh, probably on a test it would already be kilograms. If not, then do what we just did. Multiply it by speed of light squared. What do we get there for the energy? One point two seven times ten to the minus. That would be joules, right? Right? That's our answer. We're done. This is the energy that's released in this nuclear fission reaction. Remember when we put the example up on the board, we said it was 200? That doesn't look like 200. What do we say? It was 200 mega electron volts. Let's convert this to electron volts and see what we get. We don't, we don't have to. But let's, let's just do that and compare it with the number that I gave you when we wrote down the notes here a few minutes ago. Yes. Yeah, we use standard units in this equation equals mc squared, so we're going to get standard units are an answer as well. Let's convert it to, to electron volts so and we'll just see. Uh, one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. X electron volts is 1.27 times 10 to the negative 10 joules. What do you get there? Okay, here's a lesson, guys. In uh, here's a lesson. Here's a lesson in awareness when you get an answer, right? Uh, when we get the electron volts here, what was it? 700 mega electron volts or something? We pre we would predict it to be somewhere around 200 mega electron volts because that's what I gave you in the example, right? It's nowhere close to that. So we know we've made a mistake in there somewhere. Turns out it was way back here where we made the mistake. This number right here wasn't 235 point whatever we had there. It should have been 235.866563 
atomic mass units. These ones are all right up here. Okay, it's just the total on the right-hand side that we got wrong. That changes this one. Okay, that changes this one. Michaela, what does that become now? 6032 atomic mass units. That also changes X here, 0 0.186032. What does this one become now, Michaela? Our method is good. We just, whoever it was that calculated this number for the final mass here, just made a mistake with the calculator. 3.088 times 10 to the negative. Okay. Now, we're going to take that number as our mass defect here. One, uh, three point zero eight eight one yeah, three one two. This is, this is times ten to the negative twenty-eight. We multiply that by three times ten to the eight squared. What do we get? Times ten to the negative eleven. That's going to be joules, right? We want to convert that to electron volts. We'll do that same that same process that we went through here just a minute ago, but this time with the right number, 2.7793 times 10 to the minus 11. What do we get for x this time? We get 1.74 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. In other words, 174 electron volts. What do we say in the example that we gave you? For nuclear fission a few minutes ago, about 200 mega electron volts. This seems a lot more reasonable, right? Your homework tonight. Good news. There's only one question, but it's one that's just like this. Page 819, please. Practice problem number one. Practice problem number one. Use this as a guide. Use this as a model. We should be able to get that okay, if we actually have this in front of us as we're going through that problem. Great. That's it for today. Have a good night, everyone.